As companies look to improve their sustainability efforts, one area they are looking at is their data center, which consumes a lot of power in the day-to-day functions of, and running of information systems. On today's show, we're going to look at uh, some of the new ways that companies can make their data centers greener, especially as they look ahead to power-hungry artificial intelligence projects. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me on the show today is Sarah Martin. She is an associate principal at HED, one of the oldest and largest architecture and engineering firms in the country. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's go. Let's jump right into it. What, you know, what is the biggest problem that older data centers have when it comes to the issue of sustainability and, and, and power drain? Um, well, you know, overall big picture with sustainability with data centers, they're just, you know, an, an uphill battle, right? Because data centers are inherently designed to be power hungry, right? They are uh, designed to be able to support servers that are supporting our our usage, right? So that's, you know, Netflix, TikTok, whatever it is, that type of thing. So um, they're inherently going to always be power hungry type of, of a situation. Um, So when it comes to older data centers, you're looking at some, you know, in a lot of situations, um, things that may have been considered sustainable at the time because they were, you know, newer technologies that were moving things forward, like um, chilled water and different systems that utilize water consumption. And Mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of situations, you could use gray water, et cetera, that you're, you know, there is a sustainability story there, but at the same time, it's very taxing to the local utilities. Um, so from that perspective, you're looking at old mechanical systems that may not be, well, we are now considering the sustainable approaches, right? Because we're now starting to look at closed loop systems. So you're not having that consistent tax to the, to the local utilities and then sim- simultaneously um, chill, uh, liquid cooling that can have another level of uh, sustainability or efficiency in your mechanical systems. And then a similar story would, would apply for electrical, right? Where it's, you know, um, technologies over time have kind of pushed our, the different electrical equipment to be more efficient. Granted, there's some limitation to that because what we just talked about, you know, our, the data centers are inherently power hungry, right? right. So um, there is some limitation there, but at the same time, it's looking at, okay, you know, are there new UPSs that are more efficient or there are new overall designs that are more efficient where you're bringing your power closer, your power sources closer to the actual data center, you have less power loss, et cetera, from that perspective. And then also looking kind of at redundancy, right? So um, a lot of data centers or a lot of companies that develop data centers have started to looking more towards regional or um, locational based redundancy as opposed to um, the redundancy at the data center itself, right? So before you might be looking at a 2N system, do you really need a 2N system for what that data center is doing? Right, you right. Know, if, it's, if it's supporting, uh, you know, an app, what is, the, what is the implication of that data center going down versus a data center in another location having either being able to pick up the um, demand that that facility was carrying or or duplication of that that data specifically type of thing. Yeah. Now, with this, um, companies that are, are looking to improve the sustainability or the the efficiency of their data center is this a a recent trend? Is this or has this been going on for like the ta- last 10, 20, 30, 40 years? When when did you see from an architectural standpoint where companies are putting this up on their priority list? So I would say that it's been an inherent conversation for data centers. Um, you know, no company wants to be building data or data centers across the country at massive scale and spending money where they don't need to spend money, right? Yeah. Um, you don't want to build facilities that aren't aren't going to give you your best product. And especially a lot of these companies, you know, are in the limelight, right? You have Meta, Google, AWS. They're all companies that get a lot of traction and a lot of heat for not being sustainable. So they've always been kind of pushing the frontier with these things. Mm-hmm. You know, Microsoft has, they've been testing the the underwater data center facility where they're, they're dropping basically um, uh, containers almost like the storage container type of, of size of data centers into um, the ocean to determine whether or not that's a, a viable way of going about it. So that, those companies have always been testing the waters of that. I think 
they're always going to be at the forefront of it. They've right. been kind of pushing down because of the demand that they're looking at and the, the um, pressure they're getting from society. They kind of end up pushing down and pushing the rest of the data center industry forward for that reason type okay. of thing. And is there is there a big difference between um, becoming greener through a new data center, whether it's like a greenfield uh, installation versus upgrading their existing data center? Um, it sounds like it's easier to just build a new one, but does that prevent a lot of companies from from looking at this this technology? I think it in it is quote unquote easier, right? Because you're starting from zero and you can you can leverage different technologies that you may not be able to implement on a um, existing facility. But there is something to be said about the sustainability of reusing, right? You're not coming up with new concrete, you're not coming up with new steel, maybe you're adding supplemental steel, but you're not you know, you're leveraging materials that already exist in a facility that already exists and retrofitting it that way as opposed to um, starting from zero. But the benefits of a greenfield site, you might be able to leverage technologies that you can't in a retrofit site. So, you know, we worked on a facility in Nebraska that we were able to um, leverage an aquifer and utilize that to supplement the cooling. So something like that is going to be very hard to implement at a retrofit facility, right? But it doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, sustainability aspects to a retrofit. There is a benefit from a utilizing the existing facility. You're not creating more carbon through the concrete. You're not creating more uh, steel, et cetera, from, from that standpoint. And then obviously the supply chain of everything that kind of trickles into um, the carbon conversation. Right. right. Now, do, do you find that a lot of companies uh, as one of their first steps uh, in, in improving these efficiency isn't, doesn't have anything to do with the, the, uh, building itself, but they usually upgrading their servers or you know improving efficiency on their hardware. Like, what do you you know? Are you able to see what they're doing there, or is that separate from from what you get, from what you do? It's a little bit separate from what we do, yeah. but it is becoming increasingly more part of the conversation because realistically, um, you know, when you talk about you know just architecture side of things, obviously there's the engineering which we've kind of already talked about. Yeah, from Know, improving upon your your electrical systems etc but like there's a little bit of a limitation in certain areas right like picking a highly sustainable carpet is not going to outdo your your servers right like there's a little bit of a balance there because they're so inherently power hungry right, right. but at the server level when you start becoming more efficient that is just ideally where you're you're making your savings and i think in a lot of ways it's hard to kind of quantify that that improvement over time and i think a lot of companies haven't necessarily come out and pointed to where they're doing that yeah um because even just like you know we've had like 1200 kw facilities that square footage wise are a little bit different compared to the six six megawatt facility but they're not so um substantially different and that's you know probably five years worth of of improvement that they've been able to reduce the footprint of what can be carried megawatt IT load wise yeah. in, within the racks, right? So like you're looking at some companies are looking up to 300 kW per rack and I haven't seen it implemented, but it's kind of the, the word on the street conversation. Um, so within that inherently, they're already moving towards technologies that are quote unquote sustainable. Yeah, It just doesn't necessarily come across that way because you're, you're talking about oh how much load this is but it's like okay yes but think about how much space and how much building that used to take versus this one rack now right now now could it could it this might be a, this sounds this probably might sound like a dumb question so i'm sorry if it sounds dumb <laughs> but as if a company does decide to switch out some of its servers um in 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 theory to become more efficient and um in their power could that be, could there be a side effect from that that could affect it architecturally? Um, you know, like maybe this would then bring you into the conversation if if something like that. But I, you know, I, I figure that if you're saving money in power, that it's not really going to affect anything else in the building, unless I'm wrong. No, I think I think that's a very valid question, and that that actually very gets to the retrofit conversation, right? Because yeah, in theory, say this say this facility used to be able to hold. 1200 kW and we're talking about a, a room within a, a larger data center basically mm -hmm. and 
it used to be able to hold that. Now we think with the, the KW per rack, we could fit four megawatts, whatever it is, right? Now that becomes the conversation of how do you do that? How do you do that in a sustainable way, right? Is it bringing in liquid cooling so that you can cool the racks? The biggest thing you're going to have an issue with is how do you bring in that level of power? Because very quickly it becomes a space conversation because you need you need the UPS, you need the your capacity blocks, et cetera, to be able to support that. Um, so yeah, very it very much becomes a conversation that we can get involved with and have worked with a couple of different um, companies to try to help uh work through those retro those types of retrofits yeah uh, because there is a little bit of a limitation you can't like i said you can use things like liquid cooling or containment etc to help su- supplement it from a providing a more efficient and um kind of leveraging the mechanical systems electrically is going to be your bigger kind of the thing that you have to figure out how to make sure you have enough space for it to be able to actually implement it type of thing okay and um do you see a lot of companies um, trying to actively reduce their power output from their data centers, or is it more of a case where they're just trying to offset it? They see like, you know, way up here, how much power they do. And, and they just need to offset that with greener technologies, whether it's solar, wind, uh, nuclear, w- you know, whatever, whatever the more greener uh, power, I guess, consumption areas are. Yeah. I think there's kind of, there's kind of three things that are happening right now. Right. So there's, in general, what we just talked about of like having more efficient um, servers and also more efficient programs that are utilizing the servers to try to reduce the power. But that is somewhat of a, you know, almost the, the demand is almost outpacing the innovation, right? Yeah. And then um, there's also um, the renewable energy credits, which a lot of the big companies will, as you were mentioning, they'll partner with developers to produce um, solar farms wind farms, et cetera, to be able to produce this renewable energy. The way that that typically works is that they'll work with a partner, they'll develop it. That power will now feed the grid. It won't typically feed the data center itself because there is still somewhat of a limitation on one, you know, like how much solar do you need to, to support a data center? And then two, um, the power storage aspect, you would need to be able to kind of fully combine those two things. Um, those are still some limitations, but in a lot of ways, it, it might be the better approach overall because you're not creating, you know, a lot of a lot of the the power storage options have some, you know, hesitation when it comes to sustainability. Right? Is is lithium ion really the right answer and and all those different things? So it, it may be the better approach realistically, even though it may not be the best story. Right. Um, and then the other thing that I think we're going to see more and more of over the upcoming years is. Um, bringing the data center to the power sources. So what I mean by that is right now we have a lot of power consumption restrictions. So in areas like Loudoun, Virginia, they don't have the power to keep up with the demand in that area. So that very quickly is turning into people are looking elsewhere. And you're seeing a lot of those restrictions kind of happen in different areas within the country, just not maybe as the same level of scale. So I think you are going to start seeing um the use of nuclear and other power sources Mm -hmm. and they're going to be leveraging power sources that already exist and how can we bring the data center to that and leverage that as opposed to trying to use the you know more conventional systems is that one of the reasons we see a lot of data centers that that go near some of these uh power generation uh locations such as like a waterfall or or geothermal i've heard uh, stories about it there's a lot in iceland because that's where they can produce cheap geothermal energy, for example. Um, is, is that yeah. also, that also then helps with the data centers as well? Yeah, geothermal and then um, from a cooling perspective and from a power perspective, right? So how do you leverage resources? And, you know, there's a balancing act there, right? You, there Because there is some tipping points of you don't want to, you know, utilize the aquifer to the point where you end up heating up the aquifer and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a benefit to it from that perspective of you're offsetting the power consumption from a cooling and also can potentially leverage um, whether it be hydraulic power or whatever it is from those those sources, leverage that from a po- as a power source. Yep. 
Yeah. Now, now, what kind of influence do do architects have when it comes to building some of these new data centers? Do you get a do you team up with the the IT group? Um, they come in you and say, "This is what we're going to need from a power perspective and from you know data perspective and space and things like that." And then you can go back to them and say, "Here are the most efficient materials or." Um, uh, technologies such as active cooling versus, you know, either water cooling instead of air cooling, things like that. Uh, you know, ha- is it a give and take or do you have the final say when it comes to some of the these design decisions? Um, it really depends on the company. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the hyperscalers, you know, the ones we were just talking about, Meta, et cetera, they're, they're already um, ahead of the curve, right? Yeah. Like they have, they have individuals internally who are developing their prototype and they work with partners to you know, say, hey, okay, we want to do this. Can you help us kind of navigate it? Um, but then when it comes to uh, developers, so there's two different kind of developers in, in my mindset right now. There's the more established ones that are, you know, Compass, Digital Realty, NTT, et cetera, who have been doing this for a long time. They also have a prototype and they work with their partners. That situation is a little bit more, um, their partners have a tendency to kind of help drive the ship. So they may have more like, hey, you know, we just talked to Carbon Cure. They're coming out with a concrete that is a reduced carbon emission. Do you guys want to try to try this here? Right. Um, That can still happen with hyperscalers, but a lot of the times hyperscalers have a large group that's already kind of looking at this kind of stuff. And they're kind of saying, hey, we want to look at this. We want to look at that type of thing. And then there's the new developers where that comes to kind of more what you were describing where they're new to the industry. Mm -hmm. They have the money, they are private investors or that type of company. And they want to get in because they understand how hot the industry is right now, but they have no idea what they're doing. Right. Right. In that that scenario, we work hand in hand with them to go, okay, this is what we recommend. Who are you looking to target? Are you looking to lease these facilities? Are you looking to sell this site? Like what is your end goal? And so we'll work with them hand in hand to kind of work through, you know, what are your sustainability goals? What are we trying to achieve here and try to help guide them and try to, where we can push them in the direction of a more sustainable um, prototype type of thing. Yeah. In general, do you feel like uh, this is limited to just large companies and and, and enterprises um, pushing this, this sustainability or do you see small and mid-sized companies coming to you for either advice or um, as a client? Like, where do you, you know, is there is there room for the small and medium-sized business to do this? I think everyone in the data center industry is looking at it at this point. I think it, again, just kind of comes down to, um, you know, how, how far they pushed themselves within a company. Because a lot of it does come down to money, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, the company that I just mentioned, Carbon Care, they are developing a concrete that is, um, or have been actually building with a concrete that is um, a reduced carbon. There's a lot of companies like that. Their products tend to be more expensive and yeah. that's because they're new to the market, right? And it just takes time to get to a point where you're scaling and can be able to compete with these companies who've been on the market for that long. Um, so there is a little bit of that, right? If it's a smaller company, they may have more limitations when it comes to that. And so it's, you know, how do you help them still produce a a prototype or if it's a one-off data center or whatever it is, how do you give them the most um, sustainable facility without kind of with, with the budget in mind type yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. Are, are there any simple steps that the company could take if a smaller one, if they've like, they don't want to, they can't invest into a, a, a new greenfield system, but are there some smaller steps that they could take, whether that's just moving the data center from one floor to another, or I don't know, um, turning off all the lights at some point. I don't, it, it, it sounds dumb, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are some simple things that they can take maybe as a first step uh, towards, towards being more sustainable. Yeah, I mean, your your comment on power, that's already something that, or um, on lights, that's already something that is pretty uh, universal. A lot of the data centers, we pitch black when you walk in and then they all kind of, the lights turn on as you walk through type yeah. of thing. Because why have the lights on heating up a space that you're trying to keep cool? Yeah. Um, so stuff like that is, is very easily to kind of, you know, pick up. I would say that um, a lot of, what I kind of want to mention before, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the systems that are utilized right now are all inherently efficient, right? So we can work with them to go, okay, this is what we think makes the most sense. This is the system that makes the most sense for the climate that you're in yeah. to be able to make sure that we're providing a um, a mechanical system that will 
you know, give them their best kind of return type of thing. So they're the best PUE. Has the move to the cloud for a lot of companies, um, has it really, has it been helpful or hurtful in when you look at sustainability? Because on the one hand, it's centralizing the data for a lot of these companies. And so they don't have to have a giant data center anymore in their little headquarters, wherever the data center was. That was the big selling point. It's like, oh, you could reduce the space of your data center from this to this with one server. Um, but then you also see the, the construction of these massive data centers. And does that offset the, the gains that you get? Like, you know, is there a trend? Is there an arrow pointing in one direction or the other? Or is it just even? I haven't seen like actual statistics yeah. to back, back this up. But I think in general that it would you know, this is my thought process through it, that in general, it would be uh, beneficial or it has been beneficial. Uh -huh. Speaking from our, our own experience, right? We used to have a server room that was an old closet in our office. And <laughs> I can tell you that the the noises that came out of that room from a, you know, just buzzing and, and et cetera standpoint and the fan, you know, having an issue. And so you hear a weird kind of like clicking, et cetera. It's definitely not your most efficient data center, right? Right. I think that's hard to kind of quantify because we're one, you know, one office, right? Versus all these different companies across the entire country and realistically the world that are now shifting to the big data centers. And inherently those data centers are definitely more efficient than your closet server rooms. So right, just right, okay. Like so it does seem like a net plus at, at for, for, for the cloud. Yeah. And it just I, I'm perception. not looking for, yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming I'm doing the same thing, anecdotal thinking. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, are, are companies also being more proactive in, in looking for these solutions or do you feel like they're being pulled by regulations or municipalities, states, uh, et, et cetera? It'd be, and I think I know what the answer to this one's going to be too. I think it's a little bit of both. Oh, okay. Right? That's know? surprising. I thought it was just going to be that they're being dragged into this. No, I do. I do genuinely think that there's a lot of companies who are trying to look for their, you know, the more efficient and um, sustainable, whether it be materiality or systems, whatever it is, what is the next kind of technology that is going to keep help pushing the boundary. But there's also a lot of push from um, municipalities now trying to make adjustments. And, you know, it's not just sustainability, it's also aesthetics, it's also um, sound, because, data centers are kind of loud yeah um typically that's really coming from your rooftop units but um there is definitely a drive that's coming out of municipalities i think a lot of the shift away from leveraging um open looped cooling systems was intentional because i think there was getting a lot of flack on the demand that to um, the water sources in different areas. And, you know, that's obviously power is a sensitive subject, but water is definitely a sensitive subject um, because it becomes a demand and you're like, all right, well, we're in a drought, but this data center is using how much power and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely been a shift in the mun municipalities are getting more wise to yep. what a data center is and what are the things that they want to push back on type of thing. And, and you raise an excellent point. Even in our discussion r right now, we were talking more about electric power and, and, and power efficiency, and we tend to forget about water as a resource. Um, can you just quickly explain the difference between an open loop and a closed loop system when it comes to yeah. um, the water, just in case anyone's yeah. not clear with about, about that? So I'm not a mechanical engineer, okay. so I'm going to say this in the most layman's terms. <laughs> All right. which essentially means that explain to my grandma, system, right? <laughs> <laughs> an open loop system is going to be a, co a constant demand, right? Whereas a, a closed loop system is reuse. So it's you know whether it be evaporative, all the way back to you know like fourth grade when you're looking at oh, yeah. the, the, the different cycles where it's uh, the evaporation cools cools the system and then it kind of you know cycles back comes back down to water and it keeps continuing. So in that in a closed loop system you have wet less of a water loss and a less consumption on the the water itself. Yeah. All right. So in in terms of architecture, uh one of the things I I feel like arch architects are always 
um, interested more in, well, not more interested, but the, the benefit of, of being an architect is to design something that looks really cool. And when it comes to data center construction, you would not think that this would be part of the, the equation. Um, is it possible to design a data center that's um, efficient, but then isn't necessarily ugly? I've seen a lot of giant concrete, uh, square, rectangular buildings that are data centers. Um, is, is there a trend move towards moving something that's also aesthetically pleasing, whether it's on the outside or the inside? Um, the easy answer is yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before of, you know, HJs are becoming more, um, they're becoming wise to what the data centers are, right? And they don't want tons of concrete bo- blocks in their, their hometown type of thing. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot more pushback on that, which is, that one in particular is going to drive the change more because typically data centers don't need to be necessarily aesthetically pleasing exterior wise. Right. And I say that because what we typically, you know, deem as beautiful is a lot of glass, a lot of, you know, these different uh, mixed materials, et cetera, that may not necessarily be needed for a data center does not mean that you can't do it. It's definitely been done. All right. We have plenty of architects who would jump at the chance to, Um, work on another project like that. Um, We've had plenty of them in the past where you get to leverage different glazing or you get to leverage different mixed materials, et cetera, metal panel. Um, There's kind of a a gradient almost of depending on the developer or the client, it kind of changes on what level they want to take it to. It all really just comes back to money, right? Because they're like, well, do I really need to make it this beautiful space? Why can't I make my headquarters more beautiful? <laughs> because this data center doesn't isn't something that people use day to day, right? So it's a little bit of balancing act with that. I do think the AHJs are pushing it more. Um, because of that, you're seeing a little bit more of um, kind of a bait and switch type of thing on, on aesthetics sometimes. Yeah. Where you're seeing um, these glass facades that are fake, basically. they Externally, they are glass, but they are walled off and cleared off. Um, to keep from having uh, heating up the facility unnecessarily, right? Right, right. A lot of times you'll see the the quote unquote beautiful spaces be the spaces that are the the, the areas that the personnel actually use. So um, that really comes down to like depending on the facility, usually they'll have some type of office space, some type of security space, some type of lobby. That area does generally have some some level of glazing, some type of mixed materials, but the rest of it is kind of where you start seeing like precast. And a lot of times there'll be play with, you know, do we use different reveals, et cetera, to kind of give that level of depth and a level of aesthetic to the building. But it's not quite the same as what you would say of like, you know, a, a brand new office building that, you know, Apple developed or whatever it is. Right. So, right. Um, but I, I do think that's going to be an interesting thing over the next five plus years, because as AHJs, like I said, are kind of paying attention to it, they are upping the ante and a lot of companies have to get, you know, in line to yeah. develop their standards around that. Now, also, there's another balancing act that you you have to take care of, too, is um, when, when it does, uh, a data center is being designed, you have to make sure that it's still protected because there's usually a lot of data that sits on these uh, servers and you want to make sure that they've got uh, uninterruptible power, um, but also in case of um, a natural disaster, whether it's a flood or fire, uh, hurricane, earthquake, you know, I'm sure there's a long list of things that you guys have to make sure that um, you're protecting against as well. Uh, does sustain it? You know, it, does does the sustainability bump into those types of requirements around protecting for disasters? Um, they can sometimes. I would say that there's definitely design solutions around some of that, right? Where you can um, find creative ways to kind of separate them and and make sure that you're not um, you're not letting one aspect drive it too much, right? So we've had we've worked on a couple of different facilities that have had more um, requirements when it comes to the natural disaster standpoint. I would say that it really depends on location. Um, ironically, one of the ones that's coming to mind was actually a Virginia one, but because of the client, because of the the tenant, they needed it to be designed to Miami Dade. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really just to make sure we're protecting the facility. So we were able to come up with a design that kind of separated the office 
in quote unquote public public spaces from the data center itself. Yep. It looked like one building, but we were just able to develop the design such that you kind of were holding the data center to that Miami Dade requirement, but the rest of it wasn't. So you could play with the, you know, aesthetics and sustainability aspect from the office side of things and you had more ability to go take that a step further. But the data center itself, it was more kind of the nuts and bolts side of things of, you know, focusing on making sure you have the most sustainable, um, whether it be concrete, electrical system, mechanical system, whatever it is type of thing, leveraging it there. So it was just kind of a different a tactic to approaching the design, big yeah. picture wise. Yeah. Now, and I'm not sure if you've uh, run into this yet, but it, it there has been reports that obviously the uh, use of artificial intelligence and the amount of power that it takes to run a lot of these algorithms um, might start bumping up against sustainability efforts too, because you've got so much power. Do you are you getting a sense that there might be some urgency in requests that you guys get for creating new data centers, or is that not is it you know you're not hearing that yet? Oh, we're we're definitely hearing that. Okay, <laughs> there um the projections for the next like five years is absolutely insane. A lot of the companies are looking that are looking at AI are looking at doubling or tripling their demand over the next five years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so that and then that so the the demand for power for those projects then drives the demand for new data centers, and then you you have to make sure that those things are sustainable. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that in particular, I think is what is going to push the boundary on bringing the data center to the power source. Um, yep. Like yep. I was mentioning with the nuclear earlier, because previously I think there's been some hesitation to do some of those things just because, you know, to some level you're always taking risks with, with those things. Right. And do you, do you want to push the boundary with that? Do you want to be the first company who does it? Do you not? Those types of things. <laughs> and do you want to be into the people that has to figure that out? And now that we're in a situation where we do have limitations of power, we do have society kind of pushing back on these things and, you know, kind of holding these companies accountable, there's going to have to be a shift when it comes to that. And there's going to have to be a, okay, how do we look at different ways to leverage these things to be able to kind of, you know, work with, basically what humanity is, is asking. Yeah. And, and you're also now seeing also other aspects of design, such as um, maybe can you build underground versus, you know, versus just putting it in a, in a building that comes off out of the ground uh, underwater. Um, you know, is it possible or is that just too expensive to do something like that? And I think in our pre-call, we were talking about outer space. Is that even something that's possible? Uh, or does it, is it just, cause it's so costly that like it, it wipes out all of your budget i uh i looked in the outer space because of that pre-con i was like i'm curious so <laughs> i did find that apparently they did push um modern day technology of a data center to the international space uh, station yeah um that was like a couple of years ago now it sounded like it's always been there which makes a lot of sense that there has been some data center component to it because how do you, how else do you, you know, how do else do you do your communications? How else do you run this, the sure. station itself? It makes sense that there was some component of it, but I couldn't find enough information on like challenges with that. So I do think that's going to be an interesting, you know, what does that mean long-term? And yeah. is it something that people consider? Um, what does that mean from a latency perspective? <laughs> like what is, what does that look like? Um, but from a underground and underwater perspective, that's definitely been something that people have been pushing a lot over the past few years. Um, there's a number of companies who have leveraged old mines to build their data centers. Um, Ooh, that's a cool idea. So, yeah, so yeah. Iron Mountain has one that they have an underground lake in that facility, and they've been yep. able to leverage that lake to offset their cooling, et cetera. Um, but I'm really curious to see if that, like, you know, as we talk about, no longer using some of the power sources that we've been trying to move away from. Do we start using coal mines? Do we start using all these different kind of different um, power sources that may not may no longer be utilized? How do those become something that we can kind of reuse? Type right. Of thing? Right. Certainly, certainly it feels like there would be an investment opportunity or maybe maybe that's something that Elon Musk then invests another company in. And he's like, uh, you know, outer space data centers fueled by the sun or something like that. I'm sure that people throw money at that. Um, is, is there anything else? That, yeah. Is there anything else we touched upon that or didn't touch upon that, that you know, a good kind of wrap up uh, message that you would have for people looking to improve their their data centers to be more green? 
I think we touched on a lot. Yeah. I think big picture wise, um, there's a lot to be done and there's a lot that can already be, you know, solved through yeah. a lot of the different technologies. So definitely feel free to reach out if there's anything you want to learn more on or if there's anything we can help you out with. Um, but I think, I mean, the industry is moving in the right direction. It's just going to be a matter of what technologies come out next so that we can continue to move in positive, net positive as opposed to negative. Yeah. Within, within the architecture world, is it, is, is it one of, is building a data center an assignment that a lot of architects want, or is it something that they just sort of get thrust upon them? Um, I gotta be careful what I say <laughs> Yeah, yeah some, I know. I, I'm, I'm trying to say, I don't want to, I don't want you to get in uh, trouble. No, you're good. I'm just kidding. Um, I think that there are plenty of reasons why an architect should be involved with data centers. I think um, we have an integrated practice where we're architects and engineers. I can tell you that the architects bring things to the table that the engineers don't think of and vice versa. Like it makes our team stronger. It makes yeah. us have a better uh, coordinated design. It also makes us have a better sustainable design because we are pushing each other to do it. I think inherently architects see data centers as concrete blocks and they go, I don't want to design that. But I think there's a lot to be said about the detailing and um, kind of challenges that you may not see in other building types. Yeah, that does. You know, we've we've been training up some new employees and people who have been with other sectors within our company, and there's there's been a little bit of a shift in in the thought process, right? So I do think there is a benefit for architects. And if you're if anyone's listening to this and interested, definitely reach out because we're always looking for architects. But um there's definitely an interest i think it's just a little bit not not the flashy architecture that everyone's kind of brought th brought up through a uh, design school might be used to right right i re i remember from my school days uh at syracuse uh the big uh architect who designed uh the school of communications was i m pi um and so yep. i started to think like would i m pi want to design a data center um, so, and I'm thinking that he probably would because he would make it like the coolest looking data center ever, ever. I'm not sure how efficient it would be, but it would look really cool. He would be a good one though, because <laughs> his, his work is a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm very familiar with that building, spent a lot of time in that building. Yeah. Um, but, uh, he, he's, he has concrete structures, right? And he gets, he gets to play with the different co concrete structures. So I think he'd be uh, fitting for it, but there's probably a plenty of other architects who may not may not have that same thought process. It wasn't very fun as a student trying to find some classrooms in, in that building because there were a lot of <laughs> stairs and hidden hallways and things like that. But from an architecture standpoint, I'd imagine it was a great building. Yep. All right, Sarah, thank you very much for, for being on the show today, uh, for uh, telling us the, some great stuff here. Thanks so much for having me. And if um, anyone wants to reach out, reach out through my LinkedIn, Sarah Martin on uh, uh, Make sure you look for the HED one because there's plenty of Sarah Martins out there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I look forward to hearing from people. All right. Thanks. Uh, that's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any comments you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.